If, like me, you're a guitar nerd, you should tell everyone you know. It's a bit like when you're a computer nerd, everyone you know wants you to look at their computer. Except it's way better because everyone you know wants you to look at their guitars. And I don't know about you, but I can never get enough of looking at guitars. So when my good friend sent me some pictures of this guitar, I was more than happy to talk to him about it. And when he said that it was a little bit of a barn find, I offered to fix it up for him as long as he was okay for me to make a video about it. And if you want to jump straight ahead to that, by the way, please feel free to check the chapters below. So what we have here is a Yamaha SA2200. It's made in Japan, and Yamaha serial numbers are a little bit tricky, but as far as I can tell, it was made in the mid-80s. The SA2200 has been around since the late 70s, and the design has literally never changed, so one you'd buy new now would be exactly the same as this one I've got right here. A lot of you will right away recognize that this is a guitar in the style of Gibson's ES335, although because of the styling it's actually closer to an ES347. And some of you will know that these guitars have a reputation for being extremely high quality, as Japanese-made guitars tend to be. And they've gained quite a following with guitarists who want a high-end guitar in the style of the set neck double humbucker guitar without paying Gibson prices. Not that this is cheap though, with one of these running just under two grand. Although that's still only between one third and half of what the equivalent Gibson would cost. This is a semi-hollow body construction with the body made out of laminated sycamore. It has a solid maple center block and it has a one-piece mahogany neck. The name of this finish is Brown Sunburst, which while not elegant sounding, is at least descriptive. The neck has this volute here to strengthen the headstock joint, and the neck profile is close to like a 60s slim taper Gibson profile, except the back is a little bit flatter than you get on a Gibson. It's got an ebony fretboard with these split block inlays here, which complement the inlays on the headstock, um, this custom style binding throughout, and also this fancy gold hardware. It's got medium jumbo frets and a bone nut. It has Yamaha branded enclosed Goto tuners and it has a Goto tunematic style tailpiece and bridge. It's got two Yamaha Alnico 5 humbucker pickups uh, with a tone and a volume each. It's got a three-way pickup selector and each of the tone pots has a push push to split the coils. And it sounds like this. As you probably guessed, this guitar did not come to me in this condition. Sometimes, some guitars, even guitars as nice as this one, get put to one side in like an attic or a cupboard or something like that, and sometimes they even get a little bit forgotten about. And sometimes they're left out of their cases, so even if the place they're kept is clean and dry, you still get dust, you still get dirt, you still get oxidation. I've been asked to deal with a few guitars like this over the years, and here's where I think it's important to talk about what I like to refer to as sympathetic restoration. When you get a guitar like this, there's two things to consider. The first is that it's obviously very dirty, and you're going to need to clean it. This isn't as straightforward as it sounds. Guitars are made from potentially fragile materials, and it doesn't take much to do more harm than good. You've got different types of woods, obviously, which you want to be careful with, especially woods that have been lacquered. But you've also got electronics that are easily damaged. You've got different types of metals, some of which are plated, and you can even mess up the plastics if you use the wrong products. You can't just go in with a scotch Brite and some furniture polish, is what I'm saying. You need to find out what the guitar is made of and what you can safely use. There's a range of dedicated guitar cleaning and maintenance products, but there's also a number of household items you can use and get good results. We'll look at some of these as we go. The second thing to consider is any potential repairs. Now this can range from a scratchy pot, which is quite likely on a guitar in this condition, right through to any structural damage that might have occurred either from a drop or an impact, or from the wood expanding and contracting because of changes in temperature and humidity. It's important to understand your limitations. For example, I can fix a dry solder or a stripped screw, but I don't have the skills or the equipment to repair a loose fretboard. If it's a cheap guitar that you own, 
then you might have a go. But if it's a guitar like this and it belongs to someone else, you can't risk doing something that might go wrong. If this guitar had anything wrong with it that I'm not confident I can fix, I wouldn't even clean it. I would return it to its owner in exactly the same condition it was given to me, and advise they take it to a qualified luthier. Fortunately, in this case, the guitar wasn't actually broken in any way, which meant that my job was to return it to a clean and playable condition. Note here that I'm not saying as good as new. I'm removing the dirt because dirt is bad for guitars, and I'm doing the things that need doing to stabilize the guitar and make it perform well. But I'm not trying to return it to factory condition. This is a guitar that's around 35 years old, and we're not trying to pretend that it isn't. Unless the guitar's owner specifically requests it, I'm not going to fix any scratches or dents, I'm not going to repair any of the tarnished metal, and I'm not going to buff the guitar up to a high shine. That's what I mean by sympathetic restoration. For me, guitar restoration is about giving the guitar a second life. It's not about pretending the first one never happened. The next thing to think about is the order in which we do things. It's tempting to grab a rag and start wiping this down, but that's actually what we're going to do last, because some of the things we're going to do before then would make the guitar dirty again. The first thing to do is to prepare your work area. There are all kinds of professional mats and stands for guitar techs and luthiers you can get, but honestly, all you need is a clear flat surface and to put something soft on it that you won't mind getting dirty. If you're working on a guitar with a neck angle, you also want something to prop up the neck so it isn't resting on the tip of the headstock and putting pressure on the headstock joint. A rolled up towel works just fine. The second thing to do is to take the guitar apart. I don't mean completely disassemble it. For example, we will take off the bridge and tailpiece because they're held on by the tension of the strings, which we'll replace, and it'll make it way easier to work on them. I'm assuming you've taken off strings before, but the best method I've found is to slacken off the strings and then cut them. If you cut them, it means you don't have to pull the end that's all bent up and twisted back through the bridge hole. We won't, however, take the tuners off because we don't need to. We will take off the pick guard because it's very hard to clean under there without removing it, but we won't take out the pickups, again, because we don't need to. I use a Tupperware box for all the components I remove so I don't lose anything. It goes without saying that you need the correct tools for all of this. They don't need to be expensive tools, but they do need to fit all the screws and bolts you're working with. Because if, for example, you use the wrong size Phillips head, you run the risk of stripping the screw. Also, keep a trash can handy and throw things away as you go, because you don't want to be working in a pile of garbage. The next thing to do is to look at the frets. If the guitar needed a refret, then again, I would pass it on to someone qualified to do that. In this case, however, the frets are still pretty good, so all I'm going to do is give them a polish. For this, I tape off the fretboard with low-tack tape, and I use a high-grit sandpaper that's going to make these bright and smooth without cutting into the fret material. This is a process you really want to take your time with. Anyone can do it, but patience is the key. Go slow and keep checking your work. Next, we're going to look at the electronics. I've plugged this in before we started and determined that there aren't any issues. Really the only thing is the pots on the switch are a bit dry and crunchy. We're going to give this a little bit of contact cleaner and move them around. We're also going to spray some contact cleaner on a quarter inch cable end and work that inside the input jack. This, to be honest, is just basic maintenance that I would do on any guitar every so often to keep everything problem free. Now we can move on to the cleaning stage, and you won't be surprised that I'm going to advocate a gentle approach. If the guitar is as dusty as this one, you can go over it with a vacuum cleaner with a soft brush attachment, as this will remove any loose dust and fragments that might scratch the guitar if you tried to wipe them off with a cloth. A bonus with a semi-hollow guitar is you can pull out the dust from inside. Once you've done this, you can go over it with a dry cloth. Just wipe without applying pressure, don't try to remove anything stubborn, just let the cloth pick up what it picks up. Next, we're going to go in with a damp cloth. Just get the cloth wet and then wring it out until you can't get any water out of it. Again, we're wiping, not rubbing. The moisture in the cloth will pick up most of what wasn't picked up before, and it will loosen any buildup. After this stage, I would advise to go back over with the dry cloth to make sure the guitar is fully dry. If at this point you still feel like the guitar needs cleaning, you need to bear in mind that anything else you do or any products you use run the risk of leaving swell marks or scratches or lightening the color or even damaging the finish. Before you go down that road, you really need to check again with the guitar's owner. The fretboard we're going to both clean and condition with lemon oil. Put some lemon oil on a folded paper towel and wipe the fretboard with it. Some people would recommend the use of 4-0 steel wool here, but I don't. Firstly, because it's coarser than you need, and secondly, because steel wool sheds tiny metal filings that are going to get stuck to the magnets of the pickups. It's okay for the board to get a bit slick, but make sure to keep the oil off the rest of the guitar. 
Leave it for a few minutes to dissolve the dirt and soak into the wood, then grab yourself a wooden toothpick and scrape down the sides of the frets to loosen up any residual dirt, and then with a dry paper towel, wipe down the fretboard until it's all clean and dry. The last thing to clean is the bridge. Obviously, we want it to be clean, but we also need it to work well. The key for that is for the saddles to move smoothly, and so we're going to use a little bit of WD-40 and give these screws a good spin to make sure they're free in their full range of motion. Before we restring, we're going to take off the truss rod cover and check it's okay. We need to make sure we have the right tool to turn the truss rod of course, and we need to make sure it's engaged and working properly. If you break a truss rod on a guitar like this, you are in a world of trouble. We'll leave the truss rod cover off it until the guitar is set up and the new strings have settled. We're going to check both the bridge saddles and the nut for any burrs or roughness that might cause the strings to break. And then we're going to lubricate them at both ends with graphite. For this, I just use an ordinary pencil. And now we restring. I'm using Ernie Bull regular slinkies, which are 10 to 46. For a guitar like this, I feel it's a gauge that should work no problem. When you're rehabilitating a guitar like this, you might go through all the steps we've just been through and get to the end of it and still yet discover that the neck's bowed or twisted. Of all the guitars that I've worked on that went through some period of being stored in less than optimal conditions, roughly half of them developed some kind of neck issue. And that makes sense, because this is a long, thin piece of wood and there's a lot of pressure on it. So my rule on that is, in general, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. And it is important to manage your expectations, because even if the neck isn't a banana, I wouldn't expect a guitar like this to play perfectly just because it sets up okay. It may still need a fret level, it may still need all kinds of work still doing to it. You won't know until you've put all the work in, so if you're doing this for someone else, it's really important to make them understand that they may not get back a guitar in excellent or even playable condition. This being said, when my friend dropped off the guitar, I could tell this one wasn't going to be that big of a challenge. The thing about well-made guitars is they're built from really high-quality materials with properly dried and stabilized woods, and because of that, they'll stand up to a lot more discomfort than more affordable guitars. You'll see that this guitar still has a few scratches and scars that I've left alone. Again, this is what I mean by sympathetic restoration. Guitars need to be clean and well-maintained and set up so they can continue to function as an instrument, so those are the things that I do. I'm not saying you can't or shouldn't repair a scratch or a dent, I'm saying that it's not my decision to erase evidence of the guitar's history. And although it shouldn't be a surprise considering what this is, it's always nice to meet a guitar that sounds as good as this one. It's a really gorgeous guitar anyway, but these pickups are among the best PAF style humbuckers I've ever heard. I know a few of you have been asking for me to do something like this, so here it is, and I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I'm sure lots of you have your own methods for doing this kind of thing, and I'm absolutely not saying my method is the definitive one. I would also say that these are all just suggestions, and if you have a guitar that you're thinking of restoring, and you're not really sure what you're doing, then you should get the help of someone who is. Anyway, thanks as always for watching, and I'll see you next time.